Hi, my name is Priya and I'm a speech pathologist. I work in the community with children aged zero to six and their families. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the ethics of care. It's an approach to ethical reasoning and decision-making with a focus on healthcare relationships. Ethics of care refers to the willingness of health professionals to serve as advocates for individuals, families, and communities. It is based on the use of effective care relationships to solve healthcare dilemmas. As stated by Smith 2004, the ethics of care is an ethical decision-making approach that is commonly applied in speech pathology practice. The ethics of care approach is embedded within the SPA code of ethics. This is because speech pathology as a profession is built on the core values of dignity and respect, responsiveness, quality and safety, and professionalism and integrity. These values apply to clinician interactions with clients, colleagues, professionals, and the community. It is a relationship-based approach, which means that it is underpinned by features of interpersonal relationships, including empathy, compassion, loyalty, and sensitivity. The ethics of care theorist, Carol Gilligan says, the ethics of care reflects a cumulative understanding of human relationships based on the recognition that the self and others are interconnected. Just like violence or harm leads to destruction, caring leads to benefiting both the self and others. Ethics of care originated primarily in feminist writings. Hence, the care approach is based upon the assumption that women's experiences, roles, and life relationships provide them with a grounding in ethical knowledge and decision-making. However, recent studies indicate that ethics of care may not be gender specific. Instead, it's more likely to reflect healthcare professionals' perception of their caring roles and responsibilities. Building on this, Mackelberg in 2004 incorporated feminist ethics in a four phase model of effective healthcare. Each phase of the care process requires specific ethical skills and attitudes. An ethics of care stresses the importance of understanding context, politics, and power in healthcare delivery. Caring about requires abandoning assumptions and typical responses to clients and attending to the needs and wishes of individuals and their families. Taking care of requires health professionals to take responsibility for providing quality care. Caregiving emphasizes the competencies required for appropriate health care service delivery. And care receiving emphasizes the need for health professionals to be responsive to the reactions of clients who may be disempowered health care consumers. So now that we have an understanding of the ethics of care approach, how can we implement it in real life? The Speech Pathology Association of Australia has developed an approach template to help clinicians apply the ethics of care approach to clinical scenarios and support reasoning and decision making. The template has six sections, which I will outline. What are the needs of the individual and family affected by this dilemma? So we must consider client perspectives of quality care and the client's key relationships, as well as how we can help maintain these relationships. What are the roles and responsibilities of the healthcare team in providing care? We must consider clinician responsibilities for care and how the team can collaborate to improve care outcomes. Are there any barriers to effective care? So is there effective communication between all parties involved? And are there factors such as policies, attitudes, and values that may disempower the client? What resources are required to provide competent health care? Do I require more knowledge and training? And are current resources appropriate? How are clients responding to care? Are there any feedback mechanisms in place? And how would the clinician and service provider respond to this feedback? And lastly, how can I improve the care offered to clients? How can the clinician advocate for the client? What steps can be made to facilitate knowledge, skills, and resources? 
And can I advocate for changes in policy or service delivery? Let's go through an example together. A few weeks ago, I was sitting at my desk when I received a referral from an early childhood nurse in the community. The referral was for a two and a half year old female named Sophie with concerns about her speech and language development. Sophie's mom, Julie, had recently given birth to a little boy named Jack. Julie is a young mum who raises her children alone after the death of her partner six months ago. During the session, I observed that Julie appears tired. She has flat affect and does not interact with Sophie or the new baby. After some assessment, I was able to identify that Sophie has a moderate speech and language delay. Due to the long wait list, the only option for the family is a parent training group which is run in a nearby town twice a week. When I discussed this with Julie, she burst into tears. Julie discloses that the family live in a rural town and do not have access to a family car since her husband passed away in a car accident six months ago. Julie tells me that she doesn't have any family support at home, has been feeling very depressed and hasn't been coping very well. Some factors that are contributing to the complexity of this situation include divergence of supply and demand, where the wait list is causing delays in providing services to clients in need, distance such as rural and remote locations impacting on service delivery and provision of healthcare, access issues such as transport impacting access to necessary healthcare, and vulnerable client groups, especially those with communication needs, being even more disadvantaged. Sitting back at my desk after the session, I reflect on the situation and my duty of care, and I wonder how I can help this family who have been through so much recently and are in need of accessible intervention. Unfortunately, this is the fifth family on my wait list, who are unable to access the parent training group due to various circumstances. I remember learning about the ethics of care approach at university, and I decide to use it in order to help me make decisions about how to support the family. What are the needs of the individual and family affected by this dilemma? Sophie has a speech and language delay and is having difficulty expressing her needs. This is creating frustration and adding to the family's stress. Under the principle of beneficence, Sophie and her family would benefit from early intervention, such as a parent training group, which is an evidence-based intervention option. However, due to accessibility issues, the family is unable to attend these groups, which is putting the family at a disadvantage. Providing the family with an inaccessible option is not equitable and challenges the ethical principle of justice and fairness. What are the roles and responsibilities of the healthcare team in providing care? We have a duty of care to offer services that benefit our clients and do not cause harm. We also need to adhere to the principles of truth and veracity, meaning that we must be transparent with our clients. I've discussed Sophie's diagnosis and recommended interventions. I've also told Julie about the long wait list at the clinic and the parent training group that is available. However, being responsive to Julie's circumstances may warrant the need for alternative service delivery approaches to be implemented. Are there any barriers to effective healthcare? Well, the barriers may be client-based, such as access and psychosocial variables, for example, lack of social support, mental health, which may be impacting quality of life. Or the variables may be clinician-based, for example, available resources, time, skills, and knowledge to deal with complex situations and act ethically and equitably. Other va barriers include divergence of supply and demand. Julie is one of many families on the wait list. Or policies and procedures. For example, are there any other options available? Would the service provider allow for changes? What resources are required to provide competent health care? Considering the barriers just discussed, how can I improve the care provided and what resources do I need? The current, current recommendation of face-to-face -face parent training group is not appropriate for Julie due to accessibility.
Therefore, I'm quite to, required to determine an alternative option. With telehealth becoming a widely implemented service delivery method for many clinicians, it may be necessary to make use of current and emerging technologies in a professional and evidence-based manner in order to meet the needs of our clients. Would it be possible to run an online training group for families on the wait list who are unable to attend the face-to-face -face option? This would provide these families with an accessible option and would ensure equitable care. However, I would need to be mindful of my employer's policies and discuss this with my supervisor. I would also need the support of my colleagues in order to develop a high quality evidence-based program. And how are clients responding to care? Julia has said that she feels frustrated and dissatisfied with the face-to-face -face option. She felt her needs were not being met and she feels she is at a disadvantage. It is important to obtain feedback from the participants who attend the online training group in order to ascertain whether this option addressed their needs and led to positive client outcomes. Therefore, feedback should be obtained from the clients after the completion of the program. Lastly, how can I improve the care offered to clients? It is important to identify red flags and need for input from other professionals. In Julie's case, trauma counselling may be beneficial. As this is out of our scope of practice, a referral to a psychologist may be required. Care for Julie and Sophie can be improved by offering a parent training group via an online pr platform. It would be a group-based program offered to parents on the wait list. It is important to advocate for changes in policy or service delivery to meet the needs of clients, especially those who are already disadvantaged. After consulting with my supervisor about policies and service delivery options, as well as duty of care and responsiveness to client feedback, I was able to gain permission to run an online parent training group for clients on the wait list who were in need of urgent care or were at a disadvantage. I collaborated with my team and developed a six week program for parents to attend. Five families attended the bi-weekly training groups. They connected with and supported each other and became good friends by the end of the six-week program. Julie and two other mothers lived in the same town and met up regularly for play dates with their children. When the program finished, the parents were asked to engage in an informal feedback session about the program and whether they were satisfied or found it beneficial. Julie disclosed that Sophie had already made huge progress and that her well-being had greatly improved in the past six weeks. She didn't feel alone and was able to develop friendships with other mothers who were in similar situations. She felt like our service supported her needs and made a positive impact in both her and Sophie's life. She felt empowered as a parent and thanked myself and the team for providing an accessible option for her. Now let's evaluate the ethics of care approach, starting with its strengths. The approach is client-centered and considers the needs, emotions, and contextual variables of the client or the family. It is holistic and addresses all areas of the ICF with an emphasis on activity and participation. It acknowledges the power disparity between the client and the health providers. The ethics of care approach acknowledges the complexity of interpersonal relationships and the role this plays in providing quality care. It also ensures that the clinician proactively advocates for their clients throughout the entire process. However, there are some limitations. For example, it may require an extended skill set, including creativity and knowledge of policies and procedures. It may also require clinicians to upskill, for example, use emerging technologies to re-examine and change practice. It requires high level of self-reflection and self-awareness when analyzing professional relationships, as well as highly competent interpersonal skills. It also requires an ability to monitor personal and professional boundaries. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this presentation enjoyable. 